welcome to Valley Happenings. I'm Susie Wiley, and thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, for 20 years, and over the 20 years I've made such great friends across the state of Alabama. And they come on the show because they're wonderful book authors, and you know I love books and my involvement with the library and everything, and I just think getting a book in my hand and holding it and reading it is really special. So right now, we have my friend from Auburn with us, and I would like to welcome you back on the show, I th Ellen, and this is Ellen Mendenhall, and you got a lot of titles. <laughs> I don't even know what he did with all that paper. We've had some technical difficulties, so we've been talking up a storm here. Well, it's uh, funny because when we were driving, or when I was driving in this morning, I was expecting our difficulties to be snow-related. Right. I thought we were going to have snowmageddon. I thought I was going to walk out of my hotel room I like that. and have to and have shovel. to shovel my way to the studio. But then we woke up to a bright, sunny day. I know. I mean, you know. Okay. Do you think weathercasters really know what they're talking about? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. No, I think they know what they're talking about within okay. the parameters. Okay. I of their... think this is just, and we're going to talk about his book, but that's why he's here. But he's a dear friend, and we talk about everything. But sometimes I think the weather is the news. And when you start thinking about, you watch maybe a morning show or you watch the noon news or you watch internet news, it's the weather. It's the weather. Well, the weather's always sort of been a topic of conversation, right? That was That's what you the... need to write a book about, the weather. Well, maybe. That, <laughs> thanks for the ideas. I'll take, <laughs> the I'll take weather, some notes as we the go. The weather. <laughs> but... Ellen has written a book called Writers on Writing, okay, Conversations with Ellen Mendenhall. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of the reverse, right? We, we Writers on Writing, and it, it's wonderful, and there's, there's a, a copy of her book, and it's available, and where can they get the book? Well, they can get the book on Amazon.com, uh, Books and Million, Barnes and Noble, all on those websites. Okay. Uh, my website is alanmindenhall.com, A-L-L-E-N. And we'll have that on. D-E-N-H-A-L-L, -L, and you can get right this there. book and my See, other See, look, so, right. we put graphics up. All right. That's We're great. going big time. I love it. <laughs> Okay. If we had those little pop-up letters when I spoke and the little they the, just come oh, like up in a clouds, bubble like or something. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, his his name is there, and and the book is wonderful. And if you like to learn about a writer who's interviewing writers, it's it's that's tough. Yeah. I think it's hard, Ellen. And I think it's hard because you don't want to step on somebody's toes. Well, and you true. don't want to look stupid. <laughs> well, and yeah, so You know, I don't mean this, uh, that to be ugly. No, I And understand. he's far from stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know me well enough then. I thought we were good friends. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But yeah, no. you're right. There are a variety. Uh, there's a variety of different authors in this book. So mm -hmm. we have you know, historians, we have novelists, we have journalists, uh, academics. And so each book needed a different type of interview. Mm -hmm. You know, you would talk to an historian about her book in a way that would be different from a novelist. Right. Where you might be talking more about craft and form, but for a historian, you might be talking more about substance mm -hmm. and, you know, historical events. And, and see, I could be interviewing him and I could keep all my notes, which is the <laughs> tape, okay, and go back and write a book about our interview. That's right. But what I love about you is you know... Something about a lot of things. <laughs> and that's the way I am, you know. A lot what, about a little, but a little about a lot. or is A little about around? a lot. A little about a lot, but not a lot about a little. <laughs> right. But isn't that wonderful? I like, that's diversification. I think I'm diverse. I mean, I like to read everything. Anything I can get my hands on, I like to read. Because I like to learn something. Right. Well, I spent a lot of time in a university setting. And there are people who specialize and they know a lot right. about really really uh, it's just about minutia we'll put mm -hmm. it that way mm -hmm. and not everybody is interested in that minutia right and so you know it, I do think it's important to have some breadth yeah well like I gave I I, I recommended a couple of books that Alan's going to take with them back down to Auburn and read and bring them back to me but like the book the Gulf Put that yeah, book up, okay. you know, by go. Jack Davis, okay? I read it. 
I, it introduced me to so much that I never even thought of. Now, I know a little bit now more than I knew before. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. You know, we know a little bit about a lot of things. If I wanted to be an expert on something. You, yeah, if you wanted to be an expert, you'd spend years and years and years of your life devoted research. to researching that particular topic. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I wanted to, in, in when Ellen came this morning, I had my notes here, and I haven't changed them, but I had to go to the dictionary and get some <laughs> definitions, which I loved. <laughs> okay, do people say that now it wasn't your writing, it was from the book authors right. that would bring up these words, and I'm going, oh, my goodness, you know, I, I don't know what that word means, and oh, and I type it up, and I had a list of five of them. Um, and then one of them, I said, I couldn't pronounce, I can't pronounce the word. <laughs> and you had a look, you couldn't either, and we had to look it up, <laughs> how to pronounce the word. But is that, that's good. Yeah, I think that's good. That's now knowing a little bit more than I knew before about something. That's right. Yeah, and it was a foreign word, so pronunciation was part of the issue. Ah, okay. But in the long run, it was one of the authors. And was it Miss Scott? It was. Miss Scott. Okay, and I forget her first name. Colleen. Colleen Scott. And it was a story about coming of age. It was a coming of age story. So the word was building Roman. And that is a, <laughs> that, that that word actually refers to a coming of age story. Okay, so what, the, the audience out there, coming of age, um, define that. Well, it's that period of life, that formative period, that marks sort of the transition from childhood to adulthood. So we're talking teenage years, typically. Or but is it different for different people? I think so. Yeah, I think different people mature at different times. And so everyone has sort of formative experiences that occur at different stages. But the definition the, the definition really refers to that period in life when you are transitioning from child to adult. And that is the coming of age. Who I think I always call it like when I grew up. Yes, when I grew I up. That's what happened. That's, <laughs> that's, you're still coming of age. I'm still waiting for that day. But I think in my 30s was my oh. growing up and maturity. I, I did a lot of learning in my 20s, but I think I became an adult in my 30s. Well, there's a new Does word. It, you know, that I, makes sense. There, there's actually a new word for this that is being bandied about among the millennial generation, and it's called adulting. So they take adulting. the word adult and they turn it into a verb, and it's called adulting. So you might hear someone say, Oh, I'm so tired of adulting today. I'm going to just watch cartoons or whatever. I don't oh know. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Look, we learned something, everybody. Adulting. Oh, so they get tired of being an adult. Yes. And and there are people that very clearly have been adults for a long time but just aren't aware of the fact that they're <laughs> Do you get tired of being a grown-up? I don't know. You have children. I get tired. And I am a grown-up, so I don't know. I'm, I guess I just, I don't <laughs> no, know. No, no, no. But, I mean, the responsibilities, you know, like we're thinking, the the, the, the novelist, Miss Scott, right. gives us this, uh, gives me the thought process of coming of age and made me think about it. But, yeah. you, you know, yeah, we're older, we're tired. Of course, that comes with <laughs> coming of age. But I think coming of age is more than that it, 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 to me. Yeah. Okay. It's thinking. It's responsibilities. It's right. coming of age. Now, when you're children and you're 14 to grown up, who you know, you haven't been around that long. That's right. You're and only you 14 you years old. Yeah. You think you have. We That's were real problem. smart at 18, weren't we? <laughs> That's why we went to college. We were so smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, you know, obviously there are different stages of development, and there's the stage when a child thinks the parent is flawless, right. and then they come to discover that the parent has faults too, and then the teenage right. years come, and there's rebellion and all that. But I think that you're right when you identify coming of age. Feelings of love can turn to, to hate But when so we fast. talk about Romeo and Juliet, Juliet was 14. I, I we, can't recall we, if it was 14, but, but she was a young, very young and woman. And is yes. Romeo the same age? Uh, he is a young man. I don't recall Another. his exact age but they're not they, they haven't been in the world that long right that's right but they're going on feelings and they're yeah. 
operating purely Young. in the rejection of reason and rationality yeah. and just riding the tidal wave of emotion into tragedy. And everybody, I love when a book author comes on. I love when Ellen comes on because you've written other books and you've read, read you know, scholastic books and and then you're writing a novel and I can't wait for that one. Uh, <laughs> and it's almost done. And other commissioned works that you, you do. And it's fun to sit down and, and write, isn't it? Oh, I love it. I do it every day. I write a little bit every day. I remember reading something about Stephen King I was wondering, how does he produce so much? How does he write so Mm -hmm. much? And in this interview, or maybe it was an article, it's been many years, he said, or the reporter reported, that Stephen King wrote 10 Microsoft Word pages per day. And you think about that, in a week, that's 70 pages. Right. So it wouldn't take that long to to write a novel if you were that committed to writing that much every single day. 10 pages. 10 pages. And he said, sometimes... It goes by really quickly, and I'm done by lunch, and sometimes I am burning the midnight oil. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure I get 10 pages pages done every day. day. And especially, you know, like a book author, you know, and we never have time when we're interviewing on the satellite book authors, but since Ellen is going to be with us here today, um, a book author may get commissioned to write a book. That's right. And then you're on a deadline. That's You're on this deadline that you get upfront money, but you got to produce That's correct. so many chapters. That's correct. And I spend a lot of time, I do so much writing, you know, in the op-ed world and in politics and in the law that I will do all these little one-off things to get paid, you know, a thousand dollars here, five hundred dollars here, mm-hmm, whatever. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, where, whereas I see the short-term benefits, I could probably produce a lot more if I decline some of those opportunities mm-hmm. and tried to work on now, the book. Ellen is a lawyer by degree. That's uh, okay. He and and you are the uh, at associate this point everyone's dean. turning off the television. No, no, no he's a wonderful lawyer. <laughs> um, and you're also the associate dean at, um, at Faulkner University, Faulkner Thomas University. Good Jones School of Law in, in Montgomery. Uh, Montgomery. Um, so you know you have that background, which you see a lot. I mean, you worked for an attorney general in... Um, I the, did. I was in Luther Strange's office, in oh, the AG's office, Luther. immediately before... I love I Luther. He's going to speak at our next Federal Society luncheon in, oh. uh, in February, which is like... Oh, tell him you were here. Tell him oh, I, I said hello. I will. Uh, when, when Luther came here, he had to bend down to get I, into well, I was the just building. <laughs> I mean, he is big. This, but he's this a very, probably, very nice probably filled man. This chair very out nice than man. I did. Um, but anyhow... Um, you're, you've diversed. I mean, you've met a lot of people, a lot of different people, and that's, I think, what makes it fun to read writers on writing because of the questions, the different questions per different. Yeah, and just to book person, just to to clarify what the book. Is, I mean, the book is an anthology of interviews, mm-hmm. and I've been doing the many interviews, interviews since about two thousand. I would say roughly two thousand eleven to two thousand sixteen. I edit a literary journal called the Southern Literary Review. Uh And so most of the interviews appeared originally in Southern Literary Review. Okay. Um, Others appeared on my blog and different publications. Uh The Alabama State Bar has a, uh, or used to have a newsletter and one of the interviews appeared in that. So they've appeared in different places, Uh but I've anthologized them and uh, that's what we have here. And in in the chapters, and in, 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 in one of the chapters with the author might be five pages. Another one might be three pages. That's right. These aren't like dissertations of it's it's no. quick and to the point, and you 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 feel what the writer feels, the questions you ask, and not all the questions are the same for each writer. Yeah. Okay. It's the type of book that you could pick up and do two minutes here, three minutes there, and pick it up, put it down. Yeah. You could keep it by your toilet seat. No. <laughs> okay. All right. What we're going to do is we are going to take a break right now so we can get a little drink of water. And we will be back talking about an assortment of topics with Ellen. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back, everybody. And I hope you are enjoying this. I just love having Ellen Mendenhall with us today. And Ellen is a book author, a lawyer. Uh, teaches at Faulkner University, and I have these notes now. Let me move my coffee out of my way here. Um, and you are going to teach, or you are teaching I am now teaching. at this time. 
Western tradition. That's cr- that's correct. Yeah, I am an associate dean in the law school, so that's my primary position. Okay. But I teach as well in the English department and the humanities department. So I have my my PhD is in English, so I have a literary okay. background in addition to my legal training, and uh, my passions involve literature. And uh, I'm teaching Western Tradition One, which is uh, the ancient world. Uh, actually, the history of the West begins in the East. I tell my students that it begins in the Near East. So we study uh, the Mesopotamians, the Israelites, the Egyptians, the Aegeans, and we move into Greek and Roman culture, and then we go all the way up to the medieval period. And then I'll teach an American literature survey. Uh, the complete opposite. The complete opposite. Yeah, and I used to teach a British literature survey that I loved, and it went from Beowulf to Lyrical Ballads, which is uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge's uh, 1798 book of poetry. And that was a big sweeping survey of British literature, and I loved it. Well, you're a bitter person than me. (laughs) I took Victorian literature. Okay. (laughs) Hated every minute of it. It's a toughie. Yes. That's very difficult. It's just... It's just difficult to read and to understand. In every sentence you read, you went, oh, what is, what are they saying? Well, interestingly, that's what a lot of the American authors are trying to do in the 19th century is write against that. So whereas European literature wrote with great ostentation and, and ornamented language, mm-hmm. the Americans were after the Simple. raw vernacular. You know, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, mm-hmm. they're they are speaking the common tongue. We are going to be... Uh, ungrammatical at times. We are going to be rough right. and ready and rugged, and that is what the American experience is. It's always this forward-looking space of newness, whereas the Europeans were the old country. It was about the old ways, and the Americans wanted to be new and carve out a new Right, space and they there. did. And they sure did. Okay, now, when you look, be- when you, you're in the literary world and, and everything, the books, the books people read, and because of my involvement with the public library and everything, you know, we, we bring on books and an array of books. It, it is amazing that society is so diverse. It really is. There's no right book, wrong book, right uh, 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 venues. You know, if you like romance, you like history, you like biographies. Writing seems to be for everybody these days. It is. Anybody could write a book. Well, there's an explosion of authors. If you just look at how many books are produced now versus how many pr- books were produced in right. the 19th century, it's pretty amazing. And we have a, a literate society in a way that we didn't have before. And I mean right. that in terms of most people know how to read. They may not be lit- literate in the terms of cultured and educated liter- literate, but they're literate in the sense that they can actually read. So there are just a vast array of options that wouldn't have been available even, you know, half a century ago. Right, right. And it is amazing. And, and, and we go, well, we don't think people are reading. Yes, they are reading. They are. And I think people read for entertainment, too. I think for relaxation. I mean, there is mm. nothing that I like better than to sit in my chair, no TV on, nothing, governor in my lap, and, and pull a book out. Not Governor Ivy. Well, Governor, I was my say. dog. <laughs> my dog's name Governor, <laughs> well, Governor Wiley. Governor Wiley. I'm glad you added that clarification. He's this little cute thing. <laughs> he's in my lap, and 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 I could read. And if I want to read ten pages or I want to read twenty pages, it doesn't matter. But I'm a book person because I'm just setting my ways. But we have other avenues with e-books and tapes that you could That's drive exactly around right. with. The, now, the tapes bother me because if I'm driving, I need to hear what's going on. Well, I hit a deer this week, so I understand your pain. Or I, did the uh, deer hit you? Well, a little bit of both. Right. I had enough time to react. And the, the deer, I just hope the deer... You're lucky you're okay. I am. I hope the deer doesn't have a lawyer because it, it lived, and <laughs> I think I broke a leg or two. But Aww. yeah, I Well, totaled my the car. deer shouldn't have run across the road. It shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Well, it shouldn't have stopped. It, it stopped in the road, and then I tried to swerve, and it kept going. But I do listen to books on tape on my way to work because I live in Auburn and work in Montgomery, and I have now for over six years, so I have to do a commute. Uh, okay. And I will do books on tape or okay. CD. But you're used to that. I uh, am. You know, I am. Uh, I guess listening to a CD or books on tape would be like listening to the radio and singing a song. 
But <laughs> do you know what I mean? I suppose or, I do, yeah. You don't put the earplugs in and listen to the book. No, oh, because okay. I want to hear people honking oh, at me. Yeah. If there's a problem, I want to know that they're honking. All right. The millennials that I know in, in my relatives, my, my young nieces and nephews that are millennials, they get hooked on these mysteries, unsolved ah, mysteries. Yeah. Have you heard Murder, that? Murder mystery kind of things and but, I mean, true crime. And, and, right. True crime thrillers, yeah. Oh, my goodness. And, and they'll discuss it, and then they research it. And, you know, I mean, they're just mesmerized by it. And they like to share it with you. So yeah. I kind of, you know, and I've always liked mysteries myself because I, I like to think I could figure it out midway through it. Yeah. Through who done it? And um, then some of them get solved, and these kids go crazy <laughs> because somebody actually solved this 40 year old cold case. Well, I'll tell you, one of the most interesting law school classes I took was about the West Memphis, West Memphis Three boys. They had been uh, charged with uh, the murder West of some... West Memphis Three. Okay. And, and uh, they, they became pretty famous. They, one guy's name, I think it was, oh gosh, Damien, uh, I can't recall his name, but it will come to me probably before this interview is out. But you had uh, a lot of celebrities and heavy metal type stars saying... These people were prosecuted because they listened to bad music and all, you know, all sorts of um, associations they had with um, musicians that may have been demonic or whatever, mm -hmm. and that they were being uh, prosecuted for essentially character assassination and not on the evidence. Okay. And uh, these mysteries of who actually murdered the other boys, uh, I don't believe ha has ever been solved. Oh. And uh, but um, the. Uh, the West, West Memphis Three uh, um, convicted people? convicted yeah convicted boys served time in prison and were released a few years ago maybe 2011 12 somewhere in that time okay. frame um, but when we took this class we read a true crime uh, a true crime thriller uh -huh. telling the story and then we went through all the court documents from beginning to end we went through all the evidence. Went through all the exhibits mm -hmm. at trial. Uh, actually, had the trial judge come up uh, to West Virginia. I went to law school at West Virginia University. Come up to West Virginia and talk about the trial. And he had had an entire change of heart on the situation and believed that the boys should not have been convicted. So, what a fascinating class! Wow, that would have been fascinating. It was, and you got to get you know you got to live with the trial from beginning to end. You got to read books at the same time and incorporate this book, incorporate the trial documents into what you get in the book. It's really right. fascinating. Okay, well, um, the only really true crime or true mystery that I know of that's never been solved was the Sam Shepard. Uh, do you know about that? Tell me about the Sam Shepard. Okay, um, it happened, uh, Sam Shepard, um, was it, oh boy, here I go, Okay. <laughs> He lived in Bay Village, Ohio, and they were wealthy. And I'm 99% sure Sam was a doctor, and his brother was a doctor. And it was 4th of July, and his wife was br brutally murdered. Brutally, on 4th of July. The next day, in the uh, local newspaper, Sam Shepard guilty. Oh, and he hadn't been arrested yet. Oh. And it went through, and he was found guilty, and over retrials, and he swore that he didn't do it and that a one-armed bandit and the fugitive, remember the fugitive movie? Yeah. That was after the Sam Shepard trial, and uh. nobody to this day knows who killed the wife. Wow. And, I mean, you can look it up. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a wild, wild story. It was a, a very elite group of people. It was Fourth of July. Well, it's true. It's and the, it's never been solved. I mean, the, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. I know that's a cliche, but it really is. It when is. I worked on the Alabama Supreme Court. Oh, I Supreme, say that every day. <laughs> I, I worked on the Alabama Supreme Court for over three years, and when we would get death penalty cases, it was shocking what people, what actual people had done and uh, horrifying at the same time. Oh. I mean, like things you couldn't even imagine. Right, you couldn't right. even conceive Pitiful. of it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think true crime does make for interesting reading. I think mm -hmm. if people really went through courts and 
saw all the criminal cases, they would be fascinated just, just reading that stuff. Yeah. It would be like reading reading a book. By right. Truman Capote's In Cold Blood is well, one of my favorite. Um, we, we talked about Truman who Capote is earlier. It? Dan, Dan. Oh, I can't remember his name. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, he wrote the book uh, Lincoln's Last Trial. I'm not sure. Dan Abrams. Dan, Dan Abrams, Abrams okay. wrote the book called uh, Lincoln's Last Trial. And the inside of the book is Lincoln's writings. Oh. And the and it's the last trial he did before he, that put him on the road to become president. Oh, interesting. And um, it's very good, but it's called Lincoln's Last Trial. But when you open up the book and you see Lincoln's actual writing his of notes. his notes and everything, it's pretty neat. You know, I mean, there was a pretty neat insert into the cover, uh, in, inside of the book. That is neat. All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and we will be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview. And, and PBS does wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things. And uh, the, that that uh, digital, kids digital, cool. And you have kids, and they'd like digital. They, they're into the digital. Seven and five, they'll, do, they'll read on the phone and all that. I prefer them to read the physical hard copy books but they will read on the phone sometimes and everybody this is ellen mendenhall with us and he's a book author a lawyer a professor and friend, yeah. <laughs> and friend. <laughs> but isn't it going to be great when your children get older and they'll be able to read <clears throat> one of your books you know, I recently thought about that for the first time. It had never occurred to me. And then but I thought, they will oh, read your works. When I'm dead, they'll have some access to my mind by being able to read. I thought, that is kind of neat. That There's, is real neat. It is. And especially the novel. And when you told me about the novel, your grandchildren will go, what was he thinking? <laughs> I know. <laughs> now you're putting pressure it's, on me to get it done a, fast. It's a plot that... You know, it, it's really cool. I'm going to love it. Oh. I know I'm going to love it. I'm going to have to but finish it plot, soon. Now. Uh, but but that'll be something interesting. How did he think yeah. of that? What was the time? You know, because books and stories change. I think they go to the time. Christie, uh, Governor Christie, he has a book out. Oh. Yeah, he just came out with a new book. Chris Christie? Mm hmm. Oh. Governor Chris Christie. And I thought, oh, another political book. But the one comment that I heard him make on a um, an interview was in um, the year, which was what sixteen, seven, eighteen, eighteen. Wait, which which year? The when he, when presidential the, election. Oh, twenty sixteen election. Right. Twenty sixteen. When he was no. when he was in in the big Republican field. Yeah. So yeah, that that would have been the twenty sixteen election. But for oh, the because primary, we got to so. go through an election next year. Yeah, it's twenty nineteen. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> So he's talking about the 2016 election, and he said anybody with the title didn't win. Mm, interesting. And when I thought about that, I thought You're, th he's absolutely right. Yeah. Not only for a presidential or for any of that, it was local, it was state. Yeah. There was a lot of things that with the, if you had a title... Out, it was an outsider's election, for right, sure. Right. Yeah, there was a rejection of the status quo and mm -hmm. the perception of the establishment. So now, all those books that are going to come out of that ah. period of time, they're going to reflect... They will. It, it will be it's important. It's just something to think about. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It's times and what we live in, and it's reflecting. It's history. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, every, every... And I think your conglomeration from this book, Writers on Writing, and the different... I don't know. I couldn't count all of them. I don't know how many... 40-something. <laughs> I don't recall how many. Talk about writing. So if some child out there wants to be a writer, this is great. I think it is. I had someone tweet at me the other day who had just read the book okay. saying, this is great because I'm an aspiring author. And this is helpful. I mean, it was whatever you do and however many characters a tweet is. But it, I thought that was a nice gesture on that. What was the question? And I, 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 I read this a while ago. But one of the things that you talk about with one of the authors is the development of a character or how many characters or something about characters. Well, it's funny. I, how I, many I, characters do you put in a book? How do you develop a character? Yeah, how do you, how do you carve out a plot? How do you uh, 
I mean, I just asked another author. So this, there's an interview that's sort of fresh on my head because I'm doing one now for Southern Literary Review. Okay. And uh, this particular author has a character named Sandy who fly fishes. And I asked him, you know, how long have you been with Sandy? Like, and, and he said, well, we've been together for years. She first appeared in a short story, and then I thought that was it. I thought it was a one and done. And then she found her way into my next novel, and we started getting to know each other. And I learned more and more about Sandy. And now he's written yeah, yeah. another novel. He said, I think I'm done with her this time, but as she's proven in the past, I, I might not. I may not be. And, well, uh, is that called a trilogy or something? Well, <laughs> yeah, something like that. He, he just can't. He can't seem to shake her. She 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 develops. But over is he time. developing other characters? Or he is because okay. she she encounters other people and new people come into her life mm-hmm. and old people leave her life. And well, that's one thing about books, Ellen. That I I go absolutely crazy is when they're talking about a character here and they're building it up, and then you never hear about that character the rest of the book. And then they're gone. Yeah, I mean they're gone. They, like it's you go, like a loose what happened that to that person? Time. Well, I, I, my, my wife and I are watching really Downton good. Abbey for the first time and going through me all too, that. Me too, me too. And, and there's one character, I don't know if you know Patrick. I'm still waiting to figure out what happens. What don't, does Patrick do? He's the one that dies in the first episode on the Titanic, and then he comes back as a World War One wounded vet, or we don't know if it's him or not. Somebody purporting oh, to be a Patrick. Oh, long time ago. But that was one of the first episodes. It, well, the first episode he died, uh, apparently dies in the Titanic. We don't know. We but, Maybe we'll have this conversation afterwards. But I'm still waiting to see what's going to happen. We're in season five. We just started season five, so there's only one more season to see if that character comes back in. Oh, is there only six I think there are only six seasons. But there's going to be a movie. Well, uh, the, um, who is it? Uh, Alabama Public Television puts on, that's Uh, where I watch it. Okay. And um, they had Downton Abbey, and I don't know if it's over but they didn't finish it up. It didn't. Oh. It didn't close. Well, see, we. So I may we have only to, been on the fifth year. Well, our our public library has just a vast stock of DVDs. So I, I live in, in Auburn, and you can just go in and grab all the Downton Abbey s- and then se- a, series you want, <laughs> and then our Game of Thrones or whatever it is, and watch mm-hmm. them all. Yeah, uh, but again, uh, it, again, that's. Did that come from a book, or did that did Downton Abbey come from a book? I don't think, I don't think so. so. Uh, Julian Fellows is, I believe, the name of the author and I, of, of the of the screenwriter. Scre- right, correct. Yeah, and I don't believe that was adapted from a novel. But I think he was when I read. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> get my computer going. Um, he was supposed to only do one episode or one. Oh, interesting. Uh, one show or one I'm trying not season. To, and I'm trying not to Google anything because I don't want to spoil any. What I don't season spoil are you it. on? Well, I'm on season five, but if I start looking too much into the characters, I might oh. and start reading about the actors and actresses. I might accidentally find out what happens, and I don't oh, want to do no, that. No, so no. I'll but, read all about it after I'm done. But I'm talking about the man when you, you've ah. seen season one, so you're right. okay there. Okay, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> but uh, then it, it it evolved, and they they they've made it so authentic, so. This is almost like a, the research that had to go into oh, it. Oh, there's got to be so much because they introduced technology through the periods. I mean, right. first there's electricity. Then there's a telephone. Then there's a sewing machine. Then there's the egg beater. And, I mean, all this new technology. And every time something new comes in, mm-hmm. everybody is Stares amazed it. by yeah. it. And star- yeah, it's, it's really fascinating how they do okay, that. Okay, now there's another one, too, is Victoria. Have you watched I that? I haven't series? seen that, no. Now, that's pretty fabulous, too. I'll have to too. put that on the list. All about Queen Victoria okay. and her life. Oh, is that The Queen? Is The Queen mm-hmm. is the show? Oh, mm-hmm. everyone tells no, me No, no, no. It's called Victoria. Oh, it's called Victoria. Okay. Masterpiece Theater. Ah, but, gotcha. again... You know, that all evolves. Even if you're a screenwriter, that's writing. That's Correct. writing. That's putting a plot, and that's a lot more work when you're doing a, a, a period piece. That's right. In fact, I, I, one of my favorite authors is a guy named John William Corrington, and he has a Ph.D. in English. He was a lawyer. He's a, he was a New Orleans guy. He died in the mid-'80s. But uh, I edited a book of, of his uh, previously unpublished essays and speeches, mm-hmm. sort of nonfiction stuff. But at any rate, he began his career as a poet, sort of like a beat poet. Then he started writing novels, and he still wasn't making the money he wanted. And he eventually started writing for cool. soap operas, daytime television. And he wrote for General Hospital oh, and Texas my. and all these different things. And, he, you know, and then he started making money, and he moved out to Malibu. Mm-hmm. But 
No one was buying his poetry, and then he started. He found a niche. He found his way to make money as a writer, and it was in television. Now, while he was doing that, he began studying the philosophy of a guy named Eric Vogelin, and so he was writing a lot of deep philosophical stuff privately and giving them his speeches, but he wasn't actually publishing it. But um, after his death, that's really the stuff that I collected mm -hmm. and, and published it for yeah. the first time. But again, for all you young people, or even people, like um, we've had wonderful people that this is their first book, and they're in their 80s, and they actually write their first book. I mean, there's a book in all of us. Isn't there I a saying that says, a, yep, there's a book in all of us? Oh, my book's going to be really good, <laughs> but it's not going to be under my name. <laughs> okay. Woo, mama. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, um, you know, it's all the things that you could take of what's gone on in your life and you can make a novel. Oh, absolutely. Everyone's got a character in their life mm -hmm. that is stranger than a character in a novel. That's right. You That's just have to put that character, you, render that character. And you know page. that character. But again, you're telling, like a lot of young people, and I bet when you speak in front of young people, uh, the different diversifications of a writer. You're not only writing a book or you're not writing an essay or writing poetry. There's so many different avenues for writing. That's right. There are different genres, different styles, different audiences. Right. You can make a living as an author um, and without having to write a bunch of novels, for example. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can write for a magazine and write, you can freelance. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily and, recommended but, but for a career path. But we also see, you know, we have writers that are in corporations that are correct. writing speeches. Advertising. For advertising. Uh, political writers. Oh, yeah. Polit speech writers. Do you think those politics? politicians write their own stuff? No. They no. Do not. They <laughs> no. Do not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you need to It would be writers. really rare. I mean, I think long time ago, you know, people would write what they wanted to say. But now every word is scrutinized. Every sentence is put in there. I mean, I'd hate to be a political writer well, today. Well, it's like I'd the, hate it. the State of the Union now is not very edgy anymore. You, you, no one's going to oh, see it. Yes, everything it is. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yes. whether we're going to have it or not yeah, maybe, we are. is the we issue. Are. I heard last night that we are going to have it. Yeah, they're going to have State but, of the uh, Union. But, you know... I mean, maybe Trump will go off script and we'll get something pretty exciting. I don't know. But, uh, you know, most political speeches now are non-controversial. And, you, right. you know, they're just... You ask, you know, somebody won't go off the beaten path unless it's scripted because they're so afraid to say what they really think. Exactly. And they don't want to mess up or have a slip of the tongue right. or say something or they say didn't the intend. Right, say the wrong word and now they're offended here and this one's offended and that one's offended. What happened? What I don't happened? know. We're less interesting than we used to be, but we think we're more interesting. Less interesting. We're, we're very um, predictable. I think that's right, but we think we're not, and in that we are predictable. What do you all think? I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I love this conversation. I think it's stimulating. You don't know. Maybe we've stimulated somebody to go write something. Maybe somebody I hope found so. that that wild character in their life that they met and, and what they did. And, uh, you know, I've met characters and people all my life through where we've lived. And one of the characters in my life was a man that um, we met at, in Pittsburgh. And um, he delivered milk. Oh, wow. Yeah, for uh, delivered milk. And he and his family had never gone on a vacation, and they were married like 15 years. So they packed up the family, and they went on vacation. And when he came back, he had no job because the milk company was closed down. Oh, no. And he said, what am I going to do? So he decided he would go around because when he delivered milk, saw there was a lot of garbage laying around. So he started his private garbage business wow. and became one of the leading garbage pickup people in Pittsburgh. The cities didn't do it. You had to contract out your own garbage yeah, pickup. Yeah, but that's okay. A multi-zillionaire. It's funny. You, a lot of people make money in some very interesting ways. I remember I played golf with a guy, and I knew he had a lot of money. And... Uh, I asked him about hole four or five. I thought it was, you know, indecorous to ask too early. But then I, I, I said, but your you know, curiosity. I, mean, I got curiosity because I knew he was extremely wealthy and he had flown a private jet into the golf course. And, and I said, what do you do? And he said, and, you know, he said, I'm a garbage man. 
And I said, really? Oh, well, tell, tell me more about that. And then he's, he, he turns out that he had started to work for the company at, at, at a certain level and oh. works his way up. He's the CEO of the company now and, um, and made, making a lot of money. And uh, now, I mean, this, the garbage industry is, is apparently very competitive, too. And so now he's got his own niche doing stuff for, yeah. like, condos in Atlanta right, or right. something like that. Yeah. But, uh, so, but it's finding that niche and yeah. finding your niche as a writer. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I would quit my day job. To right. Just say, it would be very hard to say I'm just going to concentrate on writing. But I, you have such a great story. How you started this television oh, program? That's a I whole mean, story. that is such a wonderful oh, entrepreneurial I story. I yeah, have you a do. Book. <laughs> that is such a great. Story. And they've all been with me. My audience has been with me. We've expanded. Uh, and that's what's wonderful. And, and I'm so fortunate to be able to come into your home, introduce you to wonderful, wonderful <laughs> people, and, and, and have people statewide watch the show. I, I think yeah. it's great. I, I, I'm just I'm blessed. I really feel very honored, and that's why I try to have a great show for you every day. Well, I'm By hookers, to be here. and I've got a great crew back there working their tails off to make sure the show gets on. <laughs> yeah, I think I see some of the tails <laughs> lying around here oh, after the so technical dumb. difficulties oh, the technical this morning. <laughs> but, Ellen, thank you for thank being you with us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank everybody, you. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. I sure have. God bless you. Have a great day. Buckle up. Be safe. And guess what? We'll be talking tomorrow. Bye-bye.